Um, well, it's really in, uh, my great privilege and honor to introduce to you Paul and Lee Langton. Won't you guys come stand up here so people can see who you are? Um, Paul and I share an early history many, many years ago of, of working into the DRC, of working into Lumbumbashi. And in those days, it was quite dangerous, uh, those early, early days. There was a curfew. There's one plane in and one plane out per week. And if you missed that plane, you had to wait there. I can remember the first time we landed, the pilot overshot the runway, and we ended up in some guy's millie field and had to make a huge detour and come back. So it's fun and games. Paul has continued with the work in the Congo, and he kind of heads up the work that we're doing there. And has seen great fruitfulness um, flow from, from the work that is, was started there many years ago and that he has continued. Um, Paul and Lee Farm on the Oribe Gorge. It's a absolutely most magnificent, one of the most magnificent places in the country. They've got a, a huge sugarcane farm that runs into the gorge. And uh, so it's a magnificent place to, to just live. Uh, Paul still farms, and he has uh, the burden of leading the local church at Port Shepston. Um, came his way, and uh, they've built a wonderful building, and we've got a really great relationship between us and the South Coast building. The first time I went there, it felt like I was at home. It honestly did. The kind of people are the same. The, the atmosphere is very similar. And I really felt that there's a future in us working together as the two regions, together um, taking on projects and together fulfilling the purposes of God for us. And so it really is a great joy for us to have them with us for the first time. And won't you just welcome them with a wonderful round of applause. Thank you, Richard. To say too many good things, eh? So it is really a delight for us, for us to have been with you these last few days, and just my heart is so stirred. Um, I grew up um, with my father, um, a man who loved God, who uh, led a church from 24 and farmed. And uh, it's a surprising that I find myself doing the same. Um, but he always used to say to us, because um, we were talking about the call of God, and he always used to say to us, use the words that David fulfilled the purposes of God in his generation. And that's been something that in my heart has been a heart's desire. And I think if you're here, it's probably your heart's desire to really just uh, be a follower of Jesus and just do what he has designed for you. Um, what I'd like to do is I want to make a few comments, um, throw a few lenses out on this thing of the call of God, and then I'm going to tell a, a, some of the story of, of how it unfolded in, 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 in our lives. Um, so as Richard has said, I'm, I'm a farmer, I'm a full-time farmer. I'm a full-time pastor, I'm a full-time husband, I'm a full-time father. And there was a time where I elevated the spiritual role of a pastor or a leader or the role that I played in the local church um, higher than those other roles. And uh, I felt like there was this tussle. Uh, between what God had called me to do until the more and more I walk with Jesus, the more I realize that they are equally important. If we are absolutely serious about taking our mountain, and if us as leaders are absolutely serious about our people taking the mountain, then we do have to slay the giant. We do have to slay this mindset that elevates spiritual things higher than vocation and other things. I am as called as, uh, uh, to be a farmer as I, as I am to, do, to preach and to do whatever else I do for God. Unless we slay this thing, this mindset, that this is the ultimate, that's when you... That's when you, now you really live. 
We, are, we will never see a priesthood that walk and take their mountain. It is not going to happen. And so, um, yes, we pulled into, I feel like sometimes I'm pulled um, all different directions with the things God's called me to do. Uh, but we have to find a way. But we can never elevate one above the other. My role as a husband is vitally important. It's integrate. We, the way that I pioneer as a husband, the, the world we live in needs us to be a role model of how to husband, how to father, how to be a teacher, how do you be a mechanic, how do you just do life. We need champions who are going to break through and just shine because they're doing it for a greater purpose. They're doing it with love in their hearts. They're doing it for God and His kingdom. And so that for me is one of the lenses when we look at what are, what are you called to do? And when we look at that, how are we, how are we going to walk in the fullness of what God's called us to do? We've, we've got to undo this mindset that actually um, uh, my role as a worship leader, uh, that's really serving God. Uh, but then the rest of the week, I just do what I have to do. It is a lie from the pit Another lens uh, the Lord has been talking to me about is this thing of um, fruit and seed. And obviously, because I'm a farmer, it comes easy. I think like that. And um, the, the, the idea of trying to produce fruit. Um, I have wasted a lot of time and energy in trying to produce fruit. Um, and given myself to producing fruit, but it's not fruit that lasts. You know, it looks okay for a while and it's fluffed up for a while, but then it seems to uh, fall away. Um, what is fruit uh, and what is seed? Where do we put our energy? I've noticed that in, for, in, in many things, um, uh, when I put my... When I, when I put my energy into trying to be fruit, for example, if I find I'm not loving enough, I don't need to try and be more loving. I need to run to the one who is love. And I abide in him, he abides in me, and his word abides in me, then I produce the fruit and I become more loving. And so I can make effort on trying to be and trying to live on my mountain and trying to live in the call, I think it's a fruit. I think it's a fruit of other things. So I think it's a fruit of being with the one who holds the destiny. I think it's, it's a fruit of abiding. Jesus said, if you abide in me and, your, and my word abides in you, then you can ask me anything and it'll be yours. Um, I love this verse talking about fruitfulness and multiplication. I love this verse in Hebrews 13, verse 7. Um, in the New King James, it says, Remember those who rule over you. And it says, Consider the outcome of their conduct. In the, in, in the ESV, it says, Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. I call this verse the fruit of fruit, fruit verse. So it says, uh, Consider the outcome of their way of life. And then it says, imitate their faith. So this is how it works. It's like, because he, he, the, the writer of the Hebrews is exhorting us to watch lives and see what, what the fruit of their life is. So guys have faith. Because of our faith, we act in a certain way, our way of life. That's fruit. So faith produces a way of life. Zach said it last night. It's actually faith is all we need. When we have faith, we will act in a certain way. And he says, the writer says, consider the outcome of this way of life. Consider the fruit of fruit. I'm a macadamia farmer, so I, pr I plant one macadamia. It gr I look after it. I put my effort into keeping that thing healthy. It produces a thousand nuts. That's the fruit of the seed. Now, the fruit of fruit is influence and multiplication. 
because those thousand seeds can go a thousand places and each produce a thousand each. So we go one to a thousand to a million. Multiplication and a thousand places. Influence. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. So we want a certain outcome. We don't try and do that. We actually need to understand where it comes from. It comes from abiding in Jesus, being with him. Being, a, being, with, being more loving comes from the one who is love. <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm so challenged by the kingdom of God. There's pictures of the kingdom of God. Jesus said when he came, he says, the kingdom of God is near you. I, I'm, I've given you, the, to you is given the kingdom of God. Um, we see these pictures. He talks about the mustard seed. It's tiny and it grows. It just carries on growing. The pictures that Jesus gives of, 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 the, of the kingdom, it's like yeast. You put a little bit uh, into the dough and it'll affect the whole dough. That is so challenging for me because that means one of, our, one of, of the people, one, of, one Christian in a school will affect the whole school. Or are we not... Or are we not producing the kingdom? It's challenging. One person in a workplace is going to influence the whole. That's the kingdom. We need to be planting the seeds of the kingdom. Um, Isaiah, this kingdom, Isaiah 9, is this kingdom that just grows and never and fills the whole earth. Uh, Daniel 2, the image that comes, the rock that was carved from hands that are not human, comes, smashes the image, and fills the whole earth. That's the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, this, the key is abiding in Jesus. The key is staying close to Him. All we have to do, Jesus walked into the room. Jesus, Jesus said, my Father is always working, and so am I. Jesus walks into the room. He says, Father, what are you doing? So remember he said, I don't do without I first seeing what the Father's doing, then I do that. I don't say anything without hearing what the Father's saying and then saying that. Jesus walks into the room. He's just looking. Father, what are you doing? What are you doing? Surely he's the ultimate son. I'm telling you the key <laughs> is being with Jesus following him one step at a time. We want the raising the person from the dead, the big stuff and all that. That'll come. But we've got to start with the like, don't go there, go, don't go left, go, go, don't go right. The text that we've been looking at uh, talks about Joshua um, and, uh, I mean, sorry, Joshua, Caleb. Uh, from Joshua 14, 12, it says, Give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke to me on that day. For you heard on that day that the Anakim were there and the, there were fortified cities. Now, give it to me just as the Lord has said. So Caleb, for me, these are the points that have been, all, that have been shared already. Caleb knew the promise. We have to know the Word of God. We have to know what God says and saying and leading where He's going. I'll talk about that one just now. Caleb desired the promise. He wanted it. When we see and we keep our eyes on whatever the heart, whatever the eyes see, the heart desires. We, when we're not motivated, when we don't have it, we need to keep looking. We need to see. Caleb knew the promise. Caleb desired the promise. Caleb patiently waited for the timing of the promise. We've heard a lot about that. Caleb acted towards the promise. Faith without action is dead. He acted towards, he took a risk, and Caleb inherited the promise. He walked in the fullness of the promise. I want to just say a few things about seeing and hearing, then I'll tell some, tell some of my story. There's some water there, love. Um, Cheers. Um, if you have your Bibles, if you can turn to Mark chapter 4.
Jesus talks in Mark chapter 4, he, the first 20 verses, he's talking about, that's the parable of the, of the sower. He tells this parable, tells a story of all the different ground, uh, soils, that were, and then he explains it up until verse 20, explaining that uh, it's the condition of the heart. Now, the context of this, of this passage is interesting because Jesus has done a circuit He's, he's gone around Samaria, he's gone around uh, Capernaum, he's done a circuit around, and now he's starting his second circuit. So he's requiring more of the hearers. They were, just before that, there was the feeding of the 5,000. They were here, um, happy to just eat some miracle bread and just, ah, just fasten. Jesus fascinated them because of the miracles and that. But Jesus now was coming around a second time and he was saying, he was saying to them, actually, I'm requiring more of you. And he starts to talk about how we hear. And I believe because part of the hearing the call of God is to hear what he's saying. We've got to have, 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 have a heart that hears and sees. And, and Jesus, this whole parable, he unpacks it. And then when you get to verse, the, the five verses just after that, verse 20, uh, 21 to 25, seem to be out of place. But actually, he's actually just still talking about how we hear, saying there's a, there, there's a way that we need to hear. And Mark uh, 421, he says, um, is the lamp brought to be put under a basket or under, or, or under a bed? Not, but no, you put it on a stand. He goes on, he says, nothing is hidden except to be made manifest. Jesus is still talking about hearing. He's saying, guys, I'm not saying things to hide it from you. Nothing's hidden except that it be, re- so actually, I want you to know everything. It's not like he's playing hide and seek with us with what he wants to tell us. He wants us to know. He goes on, he says, if, in verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, that is only ever said by Jesus in Scripture. If anyone had ears to hear, let him hear. Then he says, pay careful attention to what you hear. So now he's, he's saying, watch out how you how you hear, because the measure that you use will be used against you, and still more will be added. For the one who has, more will be given. For the, from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken. Jesus is saying, if we have ears to hear and a heart willing to obey, we're going to get what he's going to say. If we have ears to hear and a heart willing to obey, we're going to hear what he's going to say. But if we've got a heart that's unwilling to obey, we're even going to lose that little bit that we were given. He's talking about how we hear. It's a condition of our heart. And then he goes on, you know, in the parable above that, he talks about the 30, 60 um, fold fruit. Um, and he says, I believe this is what that means. He's saying, actually, even if you only produce 30 fold fruit of what you hear, there's a guarantee if you carry on hearing with a heart willing to obey, you're going to get 60 and 100. I'm going to grow it. It's not like, oh, you guys are going to get 30, 60, but those oaks are going to get 100. You just didn't cut it. It's not like that. It's actually, so long as you keep on this journey, you're going to get 100 fold. So long as your heart is saying, I'm willing. I'm, yes, Lord, I'm, going, I'm hearing to do. I'm, I'm hearing to do. I'm willing. That, I believe, Jesus is defining he, how we hear. <clears throat> you see, God has given us the ability to see what cannot be seen. We have been given, there's nothing else in creation that is able to see. Um, with the, heart, with the eyes of our hearts. We, but we can hear and see with the eyes of our hearts. Um, if you had to close your eyes and I had to say pink elephant, you would immediately see it. There isn't such a thing. This stand here, any, anything you see here, was first imagined and then it was designed, created, drawn, and manufactured, and now we see it. God has given us the ability to see what cannot be seen. That is faith. Faith is seeing it before it actually can be. 
And part of walking in the call is seeing it. How God works with us is we have to have eyes to see. And sometimes because of circumstance, sometimes because of history, sometimes because of the context we're in, we lose the eyes to see. God, God wants to open our eyes all the time. He wants to open our eyes. The, the word truth in Scripture in the New Testament, I think it's 101 times it's found. 96 of those times is translated as aletheia, which means genuine, authentic. So it's like God has a genuine, authentic view of things. He has an authentic view, God's authentic view of something. We have our own perspective of all the things. But truth is coming in to line with how he sees it. And that's the eyes of our hearts. If if you look at all the stories, God began to, to show uh, see, you, you began to see something. You, you began to see, even prophecy is one of the ways that God speaks to us, but it's only like a glimpse into the future of what could possibly be if we respond how we should. It's like an invitation into what could be. God does that so that we can keep our eyes fixed. We can make decisions fixed. We can desire what He wants. He wants us to see what He's seeing. I'll say a few words about inheritance and then I'll tell you stories. I, I love inheritance. It's, the Bible has layers of truth. There's uh, sowing and reaping, there's blessing, there's, but for me, inheritance is awesome because uh, you get it for free. Yeah. yeah. And it's legal. <laughs> Deuteronomy. <laughs> My favorite scripture on inheritance, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God. But things revealed belong to us and our children and our children's children. It's beautiful. That means everything you walk in should not ever be lost. Everything you know about God, it's like Zach was talking last night about partnering with our children. Everything you know should not be lost, should be passed on. The secret things belong to God, but everything revealed from the beginning till now is yours. I love inheritance because yes, I come from a long line of people of faith. I have like six great uncles and aunts who went and became missionaries into Africa all over the place. My dad loved Jesus more than anything, served God, modeled something for me. So I get a whole lot of stuff for free, but you know what's even more wonderful? Inheritance is not only by blood through faith and patience, not through blood. Through faith and patience, they inherited the promise of God. I've inherited stuff from people who are not my family. I will take it with both hands. You get it for free. Yes, you have to work for it. You have to, you have to work and contend for it. You have to exercise faith, take a hold of it, but it's yours. If you're a first generation believer, somebody in your church next to you, somebody, some, someone who does family like, wow, just love that. Take it. It's yours. Yeah. It's ex- you have access. You're not excluded. <coughs> Let me talk about some stories. Um, I think that'll work. No. So my dad... Um, in a sense, was a pioneer. Uh, about 45 years ago, uh, he pioneered a, a, a place called the Oruby Bible Camp. There was no, there was no uh, campsite for poorer communities. In that time, it was the um, Zulu and the Indian communities. 
and the church that he was leading was in the Indian community. There was no multiracial campsite where we stayed. And so he went to the apartheid government and said, I want a campsite where we all can all be together. And they said, you mean you all want to be in the same place? <laughs> so it took three years because I didn't have a grid for everyone wanting to be together. He pioneered something. Some of you need to pioneer some multiracial stuff. There's a problem of racism in our, in our country. It's not going to get sorted out by our government. Some of us need to pioneer some things. We need to take on some battles. Say, come on, give me this mountain. Who's going to do it? It is God's intent that through the church, His manifold wisdom, God's clever, God's brilliance, God's amazing way of how we should, God's system of living should come and be manifest to everyone. That's your job. That's what you're called to do. We're called to champion God's heart, God's system of living. The government's never going to work out how to put the races together. It's got to come from the church. We've got to model it. That's why every local church is a model of how we do that thing together. My father planted a church, and we were totally multiracial in, I think it was like the 80s. We did worship in multi, uh, both languages. Uh, I grew up in that. I didn't know anything else. That time, it was a statement to society. This is the answer. I'm sad to say that we've made some ground as the church, but I think there's a whole lot more we can do. We can pioneer in these areas of how we... How, we, how the races come together, how we partner together in the gospel, regardless of what background, economic background we come from. The answers are in the church. The government's not going to solve our economic problem. And it's not going to be solved by the Christians complaining about it, especially the white Christians. Did you hear that? It's not going to be solved by that. It's going to be solved by people who have a kingdom heart and say, God, help us. How can we solve this problem? I have a young man who works for me. His name is Pusiso Mkungu. Uh, he's my right-hand man. He came to me about seven or eight years ago. Um, and uh, he was with me for a couple, probably been saved now about four years. Um, he's my manager. He runs my farm. That's why I can be here. And... Um, it's been an incredible journey with him, just helping him. He wasn't, he's got a father and a mother, but he wasn't mentored in finance. He wasn't mentored in business. Um, and I have these moments with him when I, say, when I, when I, when I walk beside him and I help him, um, and his whole mindset is radically changing. He's come from like, I'm um, just a victim of my circumstance mindset, and now he's starting to see, yeah, I could, I could do this business, I could do that. Starting to, things are starting to happen in his life. It's been an amazing journey of just walking with him and saying to him, actually, and challenging them at moments, saying to him, what about your kids? Are you going to raise them like you were raised, or are you going to break that cycle? And there are moments where we've had where there's just tears running down his eyes. And he says, you know, you're helping me now. It's like, he calls me my perfect boss. <laughs> Obviously doesn't know me that well. <laughs> but we are the best of mates. And uh, I couldn't do what I do. He's called to farm. And I love it because it helps me, amazing. Um, we run a guest house now, it's about 15 years we've been running a guest house, but 15, 16 years ago, so the farm that um, I bought from my father in 93, um, there were a couple of uh, old farmhouses and we, God put it in our hearts to pioneer 
uh, guest houses. Now we live in a, now it's a very successful um, a tourism area, but back then it wasn't. So we spent a lot of money fixing these houses, getting them ready. My uncle, my neighbors, my, some of my, my, the, my neighbors came to me and said, what are you doing? You're wasting money. Who's gonna come to Oruby Gorge on holiday? <laughs> eyes to see. God has to give us eyes to see what can't be seen. That's faith. Eyes to see what cannot be seen. Um, when, uh, when Lee and I were engaged, uh, someone gave us a prophetic word. They said, I see you with a plow, one of those hand oxen plow, and you're plowing to the air, because our, our, our farm, there's a, um, Oribe Gorge is the one boundary of our farm, so there's cliffs. He said, I see you with this plow, and you go off the gorge, and you go flying. <laughs> Not, check, he was thinking the worst. Uh, you, go, you go flying, and then you come back, you know, and then you go again. So we began to see that God was wanting this farm to be uh, launching and a, and a base that would send us to the nations and come back. And um, that was like 93. Then in about 2003, you see, God gives you a picture. God's, God begins to show you something of what your future, what he wants you to do. But it like, feels like it's far off. feels like you'll never get there. Um, in 2003, we planted our first macadamia. Um, we we said to the Lord, "These trees are going to send us to the nations." That was the vow we made to God. And I'm glad to say, it took us eight years before we started reaping. The year after we planted, in fact, six months after we planted, do you know when when you embark on a faith venture? When you see what God has for you, when you put your eyes on what cannot be seen, the enemy is always very close because he knows if he can take that seed, then he can sort it out and you're not going to get there. The drought came. For six months, we carted water. We had no water on our farm. We carted water to keep our trees alive with water tankers, kept them alive with buckets, uh, 7,000 trees. <laughs> I pruned those trees myself with these hands, every one of them. Now they're producing. Last year we, we produced 100 tons of nuts. 100 tons of nuts. Through faith and patience, you inherit the promises of God. What has God, God called you to? Do you see God, whether it's for planning a church, going to a different nation, or whatever venture God has for you, it requires faith. First big thing we, was what I said in the beginning, you got to get out of the way that being a teacher or a student or whatever isn't spiritual enough. Thinking of the scripture, Matthew 28. As you go, preach the gospel. Baptize, make disciples. As you go, that's what it says. As you go through life, use every, every opportunity to bring the kingdom of God. Um, I wanna t I'll tell you one more story, our building. Um, so we've been leading the church in Port Shepson for seven years. I'd been leading for six months, and I get a letter from the, so we had the, my, the person who led before me um, started the building project, and we got up to the platform, and then we stopped for about two years. Get a letter from the municipality saying, you are not allowed to stop building. It's part of the building rigs. So I'm like, oh, Jesus. We are not ready to build. We're just stabilizing things. We're like, how do I... So we like think up a plan. We think, okay, if we get 30,000 rand, we would be able to do a little bit of earthworks, put some drains in, make level things a little bit. We, f we feel like, okay. So, but I know we cannot raise 30,000 rand. I, it's just beyond us, I know. So I go to Jesus, and I'm on my knees, and I'm crying. I say, God, you need to give me faith for this 30,000 rand. I need to see what you're seeing. Eventually, I get on the page, 
And I'm now, uh, yes, we can do this. I see what he sees. 30,000 rand. It was beyond me. It was beyond us in my eyes. Um, so I go to the people. We're going to do an offering. We do an offering. We get 30,000 rand. We do a little bit of our, our first phase. While we, we decide we're going to work on the, on the land, we, so we only spend about half of that. And God puts faith in the hearts of the people. Um, and then they say, what are we doing next? We think up a phase, 85,000 rand. God says to me, two offerings, three months apart. I'm on my knees again. Jesus, 85,000 rand. I don't know if we can do this. It's beyond us. I felt the same for the 30 as the 85. Uh, one offering, 45 grand comes in. Another offering, we did about 110,000 rand's work. We, then we need 150,000 rand. I'm on my knees again. Lord. <laughs> I don't know if we can do this. I felt the same as I felt for the 30. I can't do this, Lord. God gives me faith. I go to the people, the money comes. Then we need 300,000 rand. Then we need 450,000 rand to put the roof on. I'm again, I'm on my knees. <laughs> Jesus, help me. To finish, we needed 1.6 million. I'm on my knees again. God gives me faith for 1.6 million. The man who didn't have faith for 30. God wants to grow every single one of us. If you start at 5,000 rand, just start. If, you've, if, 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 you, if, if that's too big, start with 1,000 rand. If you're trusting God for a building, open a building fund. If you have one rand, put it in and trust God for the second rand. But you've got to start somewhere, otherwise you're not going to start. 30,000 was beyond me. I'm just being honest. We're not wealthy like in, in uh, Port Elizabeth. <laughs> We're from the south coast. But that's how God works. He wants to grow us in our journey. He wants to, he wants to make... I mean, I, I feel bulletproof now because God... <laughs> 1.6. But actually, we're trusting for our next phase now. And I'm back on my... I'm like... I don't think I've got faith for one, because if, if we got another 1.6, we could double our building. But I'm like, I don't know if I have faith for it. I have to go back. God has to give me faith. I have to see what he sees. So, faith is about risk. R-I-S-K. Risk, number one, ready. Make the adjustments. Be ready. Order yourself. Constant character development. Chip away at the dream. Make little steps towards. Little obediences in the direction of what God's called you to do will get you there. Don't wait for, don't wait for the sweeping miracle that will take you from 0 to 100 in two seconds. R in risk is ready. I in risk is involved. The kingdom of God is all of your life. You are totally in. Your church involvement and all of your other involvement, that's the kingdom of God. Don't separate it. Live like that. Every part, every part of you. S, submit it. You can't do it alone. God planted us in a family. God, the, we, God it's, it's that community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the thing that's going on there, the beauty, the dynamic, the unity of purpose, mind, heart, soul that's going on there, that's what he wants to bring down here, community. That community as it is in heaven, on earth. That, what we see up there, that's what he wants. Community, we have, we need it. Accountability. No independence. And K in risk is king. That's our motivation. We do it for this incredible king. The more I see him, the more I'm taken by him, the more I want to lay my life down for him, the more energy I have for him. Let's risk it all for our king because he's worth it. Thanks, Chris. If God's challenged you in any one of these things, stand. Don't stand just because... Uh, if you've seen something that, that actually you need to make an adjustment on, just respond to what God is doing.
Jesus, we love you. Thank you that you're here, you're with us, you're in the room. Holy Spirit, would you come now and make alive what we are seeing? Would you come now and burn in our hearts, O oh God, that there would be such a desire that would flow out of this, that we would not be able to not act on what you are saying? O oh God, would your kingdom come so powerfully in our hearts? Would you keep arresting our attention and keeping our eyes on what you see for the, for the sake of your name? Father, I pray for your anointing for life. Pray for your anointing on every person, every aspect and sphere that your kingdom would come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.